Holy Spirit, be with us today and let us hear your words. Holy Spirit, exalt the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We exalt your name, Jesus. Power in your name, Jesus. There's healing in your name, Jesus. There's deliverance in your name, Jesus. There's victory in your name, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Hallelujah. Today, may there be a fresh start. It's a powerful way, God. We would start fresh by forgiving every person and not taking any grudges into the new year. That we start fresh by setting aside the things that have us bound and we'd be set free and breaking chains, God, pulling down strongholds, God, and being free in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us, God, to rise up to be your people, to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living church in power. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Okay, so how many of you know Jesus loves you? Did you have a did you have an okay Christmas? I hope it was. Not everyone does, you know. It's a hard time. I know some of you were without your mother or your father, without your father or your spouse or something for the first time or maybe the second year, and that's hard at, at holidays and all of that. And um, so the, this Christmas, I bought my wife this uh, um, beautiful diamond ring and. Uh, one of my friends said, I, I thought she wanted those, one of those pretty four-wheel drive vehicles. And I said, well, where, where in the world was I going to find a fake Jeep? I didn't know where I could get one of those. <laughs> so, Actually, I, I have one of those fake diamonds on my college ring. It's a, what do they call it? It's zirconia or whatever it is. And they look pretty good. Nobody know the difference. And you could give the rest of the money instead of buying a real dime, diamond. You, maybe you've already bought yours, Travis, but you could, you could have put that to God and then get her all these fake big ones for cheaper, everything like that. And she, just to show her what she's really worth to you, you know what I'm saying. Look around the world, one thing you can say for sure, never in the time of history do I, that I know of, can you look around and go, wow, Jesus could come back any time. I mean, the signs of the time are all around. People say, what's happening? And, and the immediate thought is, is that from biblical, from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the words of Jesus, it just looks like things are lining up for Christ to come back any time and he could come any time. How many of you think that he could come in 2017? I definitely think so, don't you? So, but so many people live as if that's just not going to happen. Just like the Bible says, like Paul said, you know, you see the signs, but nothing changes. You just kind of roll along and nothing changes because you don't take it serious. But he that hath this hope, Paul says, purifies himself, even as he, God, is pure, to realize that Christ could come back at any minute. And here we have the, we're, we're on the, the, we don't live in fear of him coming, but we live with expectation and great hope and joy. And then we also live as close to God as we can. I'm hearing a little bit of a of a roar. I'm not sure if, if, I, if I'm in the, I'm probably in the monitors because I like to hear myself. I don't know for sure. But anyway, uh, so uh, I, I was just saying, you know, you look around the, the world. The world, the, our culture is just going to the, to the tank, isn't it? It's so different. I mean, I, I look back not long ago in the early 60s and at these quote unquote rock groups, you know, the evil Beatles. I want to hold your hand. And they're dressed up in suits with little ties. And their hair that was long is like nothing. Now you got freaky looking people singing on television, entertaining with the weirdest stuff and, you know, indecent dress and just goofy looking things. And I was looking, I saw the, some of the wealthiest people in the world. And one of them is this guy that... So weird looking, he paints his face up wild and does all this music that's kind of vulgar and carries on and in our world, our culture eats it up like popcorn at the movies. It's like our culture is a mess, it's worldwide in America. And then right here and, and in the church world, the church is powerless because we have an awakened to see the culture we live in and God's wanting an army. We have a war that's worth fighting and that's the war of the spirit, the war of God as soldiers. Like the songwriter said, revive us again, fill each heart with your love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. 
Amen. Jeff, you're singing it. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us. Uh, and there's another song that says, Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ the royal master leads in against the foe into battle see his banner go and that's we'll stop there but listen we forget you are in a battle war if not for your own soul, for the souls of your children and your grandchildren, because the culture that we live in is so evil. It's sucking people down the tubes. And the church in America is not healthy. Oh, they'll talk about Jesus. They'll talk about all the things Jesus has done. They'll talk about the centrality of the gospel. But they, they, they leave people in darkness. They don't put the mirror of God's word and truth and confront their lives where they see themselves, where instead of falling on their knees and turning from sin and repenting and being baptized, which is a sign you need to, when you repent as an adult, you get baptized in water to say you're dead to yourself, you're alive to Christ, you die. Even as Christ has died, you identify, you rise up to new life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And you don't get that kind of speaking, you just get Jesus loves you and he'll forgive you and as if everyone's going to go to heaven that believes in the name of Jesus or the story of Jesus. And let me tell you something, you can believe in the name of Jesus and the story of Jesus and bust hell wide open because you've never really repented of your sin and cried out, woe is me, a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips like Isaiah when he saw the Lord, he was aware that he needed the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So we have churches that just don't bring up certain things. They don't bring up, most churches don't ever bring up anything to make a person feel uncomfortable. They don't bring up what the book says. They don't bring up that living together before you're married is absolutely sin. And while you willfully live in that sin, there is no forgiveness for that sin. It's a difference in willful sin and weak sin. Being weak and sinning as opposed to willfully living in sin, big difference. When someone says, well, everybody has their sin, I've got my sin, and they're willfully living in sin, I'm sorry. The Bible's clear, it says it very clear. I always, I always said to myself, you know, I'm just not a very good pastor, if you wanna be honest. I have a pastor's heart, but I'm not a very good church leader. But I've committed to one thing. I've committed to the fact that I'm not here to build attendance. I'm here to speak the truth of Jesus and his word that will cut, like the Bible says, like a two-edged sword. Because without the cutting of the word, there's no, there's no repentance and no turning from sin. And, 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 you know, it's one thing. You can say, well, I don't, you know, I personally don't agree with this, but, you know, do, you know, you can be a Christian and do certain things. And I'm sorry, there are certain things the Bible lists, and it lists a lot of things. It lists unforgiveness, hatred. It lists a, a person that makes conflict everywhere they go, a gossip. It lists adultery. It lists a lot of things. And these people will not be a part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said there are people that will think they're a part of the kingdom of God, but he's going to say because you knew the truth, but you didn't obey the truth, go away. I never knew you. Because when you walk with him, you live it. You're not saved by living it. You're saved by grace. But true grace comes in and captures your heart and changes your heart. It doesn't just leave you with the knowledge. See, there's a lot of people going to know about Jesus and the story of Jesus, and they're not going to make heaven. So where, where, where is the boldness to say that the Bible clearly teaches that a man to lie with a man is sin and a woman to lie with a woman is sin? That's sin. It's a choice of gratification, physical gratification. It's sin. It's sin to take a baby's life out of a mother's womb because life begins at conception and it's wrong. There are other things that I will leave unsaid, but let's just go to the Ten Commandments and read them and see if your heart's convicted. Lying and stealing and cheating. So many other things that you can do. But our culture, 
our culture is almost universal salvation. You believe in God, and so, so much so that it doesn't even have to be this religion, long as you're sincere and you're good. That's not what the book says. The book says there's one way in the name of Jesus Christ that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that only through Jesus can you have eternal life. Through the preaching of the cross, it's to bring people to the acknowledgement that they need Jesus. It's only Jesus. It's this book. I'm sorry, it's narrow, but it's true. And this gospel and this God is a God of love, but also a God of truth. He tells the truth out of his mercy to get you to turn to him just like a good parent does to, to protect their children from getting run over in the street. And they put up the boundaries and put up a fence in their backyard to say, these are, these, this is the area you stay within. So within every pleasure, he gives you boundaries so that you're healthy and happy and that you walk with God. But too many people want to judge this book and you want to tear certain pages out because it just doesn't seem right or it's cruel. No, the cruelness is how you treat a person in sin. That's the cruelness, not speaking the truth about sin. You understand? And who are you to judge and to pull out? Either throw the whole thing away and walk away from God, and I'm giving you, I'm giving you that alternative because to stay somewhere in the middle is terrible. Either believe it all or throw it out. But the Bible says every word in this book is true, and it's inspired, and God breathed, and God gave it. And these, this commandment, the holy law of God, is absolutely sure. But we have a culture that's in trouble. And this culture, these people, God is looking for a people to rise up and be the army of God to fight the battle. The battle is fought on our knees. We're looking for an army that's fit, not spiritually fat, but spiritually alive, that will fast to get more power by the Spirit, that will pray, that will commit. And at the close of the service, there's a sign up out here at the, at the, at the uh, sign up desk, the registration desk with the paper sign up. And there's places there for you to sign up to be a part of a prayer team. Gideon, the story today is about Gideon, and Gideon ended up with 300 soldiers. D.L. Moody said, give me 10 men that are committed, totally sold out for God, and I'll change this world. I'm not D.L. Moody. I need 300. You'll see that Gideon was weak. God reduced the number against 135,000 to 300 in this story. So... I had a plan of prayer a couple years ago. It wasn't my plan. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me that I shared. It sounded good to me, someone else shared, but it was a plan for another place, like planting the uh, seed in the soil that's not your seed. And I, I tried to put the circle prayers together. It, it didn't work here. But this one is from God. And I'm asking you to hear God with me on it. In a story at the end, they have 300 people, and Gideon takes and puts them in companies, the NIV says, 100 in each company. See, organization is part of the church. One of the gifts of the Spirit is administration or organize. So we, we're going to organize different than Gideon. We're going to have 300. We're going to have a leader for 10. And so you may want to go out there because it's signed up by 10. You may want to talk to some of your friends and sign 10 of you up together saying, this is our 10. You go there and you put your names together. It's okay if we have 400. It's okay if we have 500. And if we don't reach the 300, I picked the 300 because of the Gideon thing, right? But we have whatever. And then we have prayer that I call you say, if unless there's some reason you can't be here, if at all possible, you're going to be here to pray. And we're going to make it convenient times that hopefully works for most people. And all over the sanctuary, there'll be groups of 10 praying, 10 here, praying together, 10 here, praying together, 10 here, praying together. And if you can't commit to be a part of a 10 to a group, then you can still pray, and I know you will. But we need to get serious because there is a spiritual warfare. Paul says that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and darkness and weakness and, and, and dark places. And, and that it's, it's a spiritual battle, the enemy. And the enemy is organized. And we have to fight on our knees and through fasting. We've got to get strong. We've got to sacrifice something out of our comfort, out of our blessings, out of our pleasure. And in the book of Judges chapter 6 and 7, you can turn there, is a story about Gideon. And in Judges, over and over, Israel would turn away from God, rebuild their idols, begin to do false worship over and over. And then God would send a prophet. God would send a judge. And God would cause bad things to come to them until they got down on their knees and saw it was so terrible. They were so sick of their situation, they finally would turn back to God. Only that a few more years, they would forget and repeat the same thing over and over and over and over again. Sounds like us, doesn't it? Oh, like the songwriter said, my heart is prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. 
And we need God in a special way. On April 3rd, 2004, it's a Friday, there was the news of another soldier killed in action in the Middle East. And you never get used to that. A soldier dies, and those of you that are served in the military in any war, thank you for risking your life and putting it out there because freedom costs, folks. And that war was worth fighting, even though we didn't want to get involved in World War II or the Korean conflict or whatever conflict. There are certain wars worth fighting, but none more important than the spiritual warfare. But that particular soldier that died on April 3, 2004, his name was Pat Tillman. How many of you know the name Pat Tillman? Tillman was everything a young man. He had everything you could want as a citizen of the United States of America, drafted by the NFL to the, by the Arizona Cardinals in 1998. And he won the strong safety position where he broke the franchise record for tackles in, in the year 2000 with 224 tackles that year. He was at the top of his game. He had a $3.6 million contract never more secure, and the, the current Super Bowl champions, the St. Louis Rams, they were offering him three times that much money to come play for them, recruiting him. But after this seventh, September 11 terrorist attacks, there was a higher cause that gripped him. You see, his, his comfortable job, his riches, and his ease, he couldn't live with it because he saw there was something really big. And in May of 2002, at the age of 25, he walked away from the NFL and all that multi-million dollar contract for an $18,000 a year job with the Army as a Ranger. He didn't make a big deal out of it. He kept the enlistment quiet, shunning interviews. He told his friends he wanted to give something back to his country. And two years later, Tillman was, Tillman was killed about 25 miles from the United States military base in coast Afghanistan. You could read the article. Some of you remembered, and the fellow players had things to say about him, and they, they built him up and soldier, other soldiers and politicians. But, but his agent, Tillman's agent, Frank Bauer, said something that I want to bring out here. And this is from USA Today, May 3rd, 04. And I quote, Bauer, his agent, said, they talk about impact player in this business. Well, Pat Tillman was an impact person. He swam against the current. He marked those that knew him. I want to tell you something. No one is extraordinary. We're all ordinary. But go, through God, we can do extraordinary things bigger than you can imagine. And that's the story of a guy named, a regular guy named Gideon. Not impressive at first. In fact, I think God sometimes just looks for the the, 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 the weakest of all of us to confound the wise, it says in Paul in 1 Corinthians that he takes the weak to confound the wise. And like the songwriter said, just a closer walk with me, though I am weak, yet he is strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. Just help me walk a little closer to you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Gideon was a hero of faith listed in Hebrews 11. And yet in my book and in the book of, of Judges, it looks like he was not much of a man of faith at all. But God worked through him. And you can track his story with me. And here's the thing. God needs fit soldiers. God needs an army that's ready for war. And it's going to take some fasting and praying to get there. Not this week, but next week. Because tomorrow's a holiday and I wanted to do Monday through Friday. We're going to have fasting and praying that Tuesday night and Thursday night. I'm going to be bringing a word from the Lord. And we're going to have worship and prayer from starting at 6.30, Tuesday and Thursday. It's in your bulletin. The first thing I want you to see is sometimes God is shouting at us and we are just deaf as can be. We can't hear it. God is trying to get our attention. And Gideon, here we go. The story of Gideon, chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys." They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they, and let me add my commentary word, finally cried out to the Lord for help. Are we at a place where we will finally get serious and cry out to God? Do you realize what this generation, our grandchildren are growing up in? 
and what's happening in America and in this world. We need to cry out to God and fight the fight and do something in a spiritual realm. So Israel's got a relative ease. Bills are paid. The kids are behaving. Business is good. Everything's coming up roses. As it tends to happen to all of us in such times, we forget God just like Israel because we're self-sufficient. We don't need God. Really? Most of you look around. Do you really need God? Are you okay? You got a job. When you get desperate, how much do you need God? And verse 1 says that the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian for seven years. Who handed them over to Midian? The Lord himself. Why? Because he judges so he can show mercy. He wants to wake us up. I'm telling you, America is under judgment, and gently more and more pressure of judgment coming against this nation and against the nations of the world, so many of them, and God's trying to wake us up to cause us to be people of fasting and prayer to do something bigger than what we can do ourselves. Verse 6 tells us that Israel became poverty-stricken because of the Midianites. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. Crying out has to do with the intensity. And I'm telling you, not we don't need to just do it as a ritual to fast, to pray, but to get on our face before God, seek Him, and cry out to God for His mercy. To cry out. We can't handle it on our own. Gideon couldn't. And every experience in life, it's a test. And here's one for the Israelites. And every trial in the lives of God's people is an opportunity for God to draw us closer to God. And the point is, is when tough times come, instead of looking at the tough times as if God is punishing you, try to see them as God's pressure in you to bring about his grace and mercy and redemption for you. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 talks about God's chastisement where it says, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father, the son he delights. He loves us too much to let us keep living the way we are. He longs to be at the center of our lives. So he's designed in our troubles that we would wake up, just like James chapter one talks about, it's always for our good. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, he said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And God is shouting to us to wake up, to get serious about following God. He's shouting to us, that we need him, and he's the only answer to tear down our, our, uh, our uh, uh, idol worship items, to take them out of our lives. And he's shouting to us that God wants to use us, to use you. And ch- verse, picking up in verse 7 in, in Judges chapter 6, verse chapter 6, starting in verse 7, it says this, and when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. This is an unnamed prophet who said, this is, a, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all uh, your, your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord, verse 11, came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Notice he's doing it in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. First off, Gideon is no mighty warrior. I imagine when God said to him, mighty warrior, he looked around and go, who are you talking to here, brother? Because he, did you notice he did it so the Midianites wouldn't see? He's in a basement wine press. He's threshing wheat. When you thresh wheat, you do it in the open so the wind will blow the chaff away. But he's down in there where there's no wind trying to get the wheat because these, these guys are evil. They're killing people. They're stealing their food. They're destroying whatever they don't take. They're taking their animals. And he's down there, a chicken. That's who he is. Gideon's a chicken. Are you a chicken? How many raise your hand and say you're a chicken? I am. (laughs) If the Midianites had done that for seven years, I'd have been down probably two or three floors below taking care of that wheat. But God chose Gideon. Let me tell you something. I don't care how negative the enemy has talked to you about who you are and what you can't do. 
when you get to a place where you go, I can't do anything, then it's ready for God to flow through you because he can do everything and he wants to credit. That's the point of the story here. He's not about to give anybody else credit, but he wants to use us. But he has to use us when we're humble and we don't think we're anybody. And so God has a sense of humor. He says, he says, mighty warrior, and, and there you go. And then he says, and then look at this one. I love this verse, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Notice the Lord is with you. That's the key. He's with us. And I want you to know something. You're a child of God. You're a son, a, a daughter of, of our Father in heaven. You're his masterpiece. You're his friend. You're freed forever from condemnation from God. You're adopted into his family. You're a citizen of heaven. You are the, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Spirit of God, and you belong to God, and you have everything from him you need, the Bible says, for life and godliness, and God knows who you are even if you don't, and guess what? God, by his Spirit, when he comes upon you and his words in you, can make things different. But the enemy wants to believe that nothing can happen because if we stay focused on what we can do, then we're never going to try anything to do anything great in God's kingdom because in ourselves we cannot change anything spiritually. You can win a football Super Bowl, but you can't win a spiritual Super Bowl. By the way, those Ohio State Buckeyes needed to eat some beans or something before that game yesterday. God is shouting. He's shouting that he wants to use you, to use me. And we're probably thinking that how can we ever have any, do anything to change the mess that we live in this world in America and in a church? The truth is nothing unless we have the third thing was a powerful and encounter with God, a personal encounter with God. How many of you ever had a personal encounter with God? How long has it been? Fresh start, fresh fire, fresh encounter with God. After being called a mighty warrior, Gideon questions, God, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Look at chapter 6, verse 13. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Verse 13 says, where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of, up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian, the Midianites. The Lord, the Lord did that. Why? Because out of judgment, he wants to work mercy. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My, sounds like King David here, remember? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in the family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, if now I've found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. Verse 19, at the end of 18, and the Lord said, I will wait until you return. So Gideon went, and he prepared a young goat, and from an ephah, a flour, he made bread without yeast, pudding, the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. This is the angel of the Lord. Angel of God said, take the meat, the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. And with the tip of the staff that was in the hand of the angel, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire flared up, flared up out of the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it, that, that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, ah, oh, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. I'm not going to talk about what that's talking about, but going on, verse 24, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. And that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it, and then go prepare an offering. And that's going to be the next one. But we need a personal encounter with God. Notice verse 16, he says, I will be with you. God confirms his priorities with his presence. You see, he looked Gideon full in the face. And so go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the power of the Midianites. Am I not sending you? And Gideon still isn't doing the math in a divine equation. So he notes how unimpressive his resume is. Gideon knows he's a nobody. He mentions about being the weak link. He's the youngest in the family. He's nothing. But the answer to that is, I'm with you. I'm with you. It makes a difference. And God is with us. He's Emmanuel. And he will work through us. 
And, and the further proof that he's dealing with God is in verse 22. It tells us that the pieces fall into place for Gideon. He cries out, oh, no, Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's thinking, I'm going I'm to be struck dead. I mean, I, I just face to face with God, and I'm going to die. And God reassures him. But you see, the point here is that Gideon had a personal encounter with God. He could have never done anything and moved forward without first encountering God. And I'm telling you, you counter God when you begin to starve the flesh and feed the spirit, hunger for his word, get on your knees, discipline yourself. It's tough spiritual discipline. It's like getting your, see, uh, I almost said something. It's like getting your beautiful self up in the morning and going to the gym and getting on that little machine where you run and you get physically exercised in a physical way. It's hard, but you take yourself and you go, I need this. I see the evidence. I see the evidence of my physical need of exercise and I can feel in my heart the need of spiritual exercise in my spirit man, in my soul. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? And so he had an encounter with God and he, he cried out to God. You know, when God is with us, we, are, we, we believe and we're bold and we're not afraid to take risk. And it's said among Napoleon's soldiers, when Napoleon takes our hands and looks at us, we feel like conquerors. But when God takes our hands, I will tell you, you will be powerful, you'll be fearless, you will be strong, and you'll be mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. There's something that changes us when we hear the voice of God. We look into his full face. When we have an encounter with God, suddenly God's priorities become the most important thing on earth when we absolutely know that he is the truth. We know that he will see to it. His will is going to get done. And God is shouting at us. He's shouting that he wants to use us. And he's shouting that we, to be used, have to have an encounter with God. That we have to get spiritually fit. He's saying, rise up, army of God, and be my church because this world needs us. Can't you see what's going to happen to you in the future and to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? What's happened to this culture if we don't have a renewing, an awakening, a moving of spirit? And notice when the angel touched the offering that it was set on fire. When God's spirit touches you, you'll be set on fire. And what does fire do? It burns away chaff. It burns away the junk so that only the pure in gold is left and God's spirit will work in us. The next thing we see that we must first clean up our own backyard because when you see God, when you experience God, when you have, a, when you have an, ex, a, a, an encounter with God, then suddenly, like Isaiah, you say, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell among a people of unclean lips. And you cry out to God and God's spirit will come and meet you. We have to clean up our own backyard. He, his family was breaking the first and second commandments with idols to bail on their property. So the first assignment of the Lord was to take dad's special seven-year-old bull and tear down the idols. And then Gideon was to sacrifice that prize bull with the wood that he took when he cut down the Asherah pole, when he cut down the idol pole, take it and cut it apart, used it for f firewood. This wasn't popular. Let's pick it up in verse 25 again. It's chapter 6 of Judges. That same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to the Baal and cut down the Asherah, Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid, <laughs> Gideon's a chicken, I told you that. He's afraid of his family and the men of the town. He did it at night rather than the daytime. Verse 26, in the morning when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon's son of Joash, the son of Joash did it. And the men of the town demanded of Joash, hey, bring your son out here. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save Baal? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day they called Gideon Jerob Baal, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. I'm going to tell you something. The whole point of this is he's cleaning up 
things, and when he did, it affected his father. His father, suddenly, when one person will stand up, when one person will get full of God, when one person encounters God, when the Spirit comes upon one person, suddenly his impact spreads to other people, and his father suddenly had enough boldness to stand up against the community who wanted to kill his son, and Joash says, hey, look, if, if, if Baal is a God, then let Baal take care of, of, of my son Gideon. And that's the way it is, guys. I'm going to tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes, just like on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is full, they suddenly weren't chickens. Peter no longer was afraid of a little girl accusing him, you'd be one of those Jesus followers. No, the Spirit of God gave them boldness, and they spoke the word of God boldly. They stood up and they proclaimed, and in the name of Jesus, they spoke, and people were healed, and they lived full of the Spirit and of power because they turned from, from themselves and their pleasures and their, and their leisure and their, their, their lovely, fat, lazy spiritual life lives and they came alive and became mighty men of valor and warrior as the spirit of God moved upon them and we got to get our own backyard cleaned up before God's going to move through us you see for God can mightily move we got to we got he's got to be magnified in our private life in our home private worship prepares us for public power from God there's no shortcuts so if there's anything you're holding on to, there's any sin you're clinging to, knock down your idols confess your sin deal with it return full to the obedience of God that's what God needs. Just clean up your life and quit looking into someone else's and worrying about what someone else is doing. If you want a mighty revival, then get it, get it going yourself, like the song said, and start that revival in me. You can't blow fire on somebody else. You can't burn the Spirit of God on anybody else. You got to take care of it yourself. Are you with me? And when you're critical and you're judging other people, you need the revival. You need it in your own heart. You need God's Spirit to stir it up in you. The next thing you'll see is that God has a will, and we are a part of it, starting in verse 33 of chapter 6, picking up the story. He says, now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and the other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Those of us who have been in Israel, we can picture that. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. He sent these messengers throughout Manasseh, calling to the arms and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing uh, let's see, going through verse 40. I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew, so, so Gideon, this mighty guy, this mighty warrior, you remember I said, I think that God had a sense of humor. He says, Gideon, mighty warrior of God. Here's Gideon, the mighty warrior of God. He's already told him, he's already showed him, he's already encountered God, and here he's going to talk to God and make a deal. I'll tell you what he says. He says, if there's dew only on the fleece that I put here, and all the ground around it is dry, then I'll know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. In other words, God, I don't really trust you. I'm not really sure. It's kind of like my faith. Lord, when I started the church, Lord, if we don't have 50 after five years, I'm going to give up. Out of my own mouth. I remember it like yesterday. I had about as much faith as an ant. Maybe my brother was right. If we reduced my brain down to gasoline, there wouldn't be enough power, enough gas there to drive an ant's motorcycle halfway around a BB. Maybe that's true. <laughs> Maybe that's why God chose me. I'm going to call my brother and tell him that this afternoon. And then I'll know that you'll be sa you, you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Well, Gideon ought to have known that God's going to do what he said. But no, verse 39, Gideon says to God, Don't be angry with me, God. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test. Let me test you, God, with fleece, with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground all covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew, just as he had asked. Gideon ought to be convinced, and he is. But see, he so much wants you to be a part of it that he's patient. He'll forgive your past. You've, you, you have not messed it up where God won't use you. You may have all kinds of problems, done terrible things, but listen, God is still with you. He'll be faithful. He's drawing people from far and right, ready. He's got his army together, and he wants to use them. And even though uh, uh, 
Even, even after his counter with God, even after he's been obedient to clean up his home and tear down the altars to Baal, and even though the Holy Spirit has empowered him, Gideon is still struggling with doubts, and he knows that God has promised to save Israel through him, but he's looking in the mirror, the reflection he sees doesn't look very encouraging. And get and Gideon, God was gracious to him and showed him. And let me tell you, God so much wants to move, and he so much wants to move you, through you. He understands our humanity. In fact, he, I think, intentionally picks the weakest. Just like Paul said, he takes the weak to confound the wise. So God wants to use you. The, the, next, the next thing is, God, God, it's God's will for us to be a part of it, to use his church. And the next thing is that only God can win the war. In chapter 7, verse 1 to 8, early in the morning, Jeroboam, now, now that he's called Gideon, and all of his men camped at the spring of Herod. We know where that is, Israel travelers. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moray. You know where that is. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while only 10,000 remained. He had 33,000 men, 30, 32,000 men. And only, and, and God said, well, that's too many. Well, the Midianites numbered 135,000. He says, if you win, you, Israel army, you'll boast that you did it. People will think you did it. I want to make sure they know I am God and I do it. It's not you, it's not me, it's God. It's not the assembly of the God of the Baptist or the E-free. It's God. It's by his spirit. It's by his truth. It's God. 10,000 remain. Well, the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will sift them for you. If I say this one to go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Now God's going to pick them. Okay, now watch this because I don't know what I think about the next. I know what I've heard, but I don't know what I think. Verse 5, so Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from, uh, from those who kneel down to drink. In other words, those that take and pick the water up with their hand and drink like this and out of their hand, those are the ones you keep. The guys that get down and just put their head in there, just drink it up, those are the ones you leave. Now, I'm telling you, I know, I know human nature. And if I'm the general, I want the guys that are all in. They're not afraid to get dirty. They dive down in that water, and they're going after it. Now, it's been preached that the guys that were doing this were watching and alert. And that God wanted the people that are aware and watching and alert. So let that be a lesson to you, because God does want you to be watching and alert, because he's coming soon. But I think those guys were afraid. They didn't leave the first time, but they're like looking around. Is anybody going to get me? And I think he took the Gideon the leader chicken with 300 other chickens. And he's going to get the glory so that none of these guys can go. I only need 300 because they're all mighty and muscular like Pastor Hawkins. And with 3,300 Pastor Hawkins, we could take down those midi nuts, no problem. Right? You know he lifts weights and he could whoop any of you teenagers. I'm just telling you right now, don't mess with him. Don't mess with that pastor. I'm telling you, you want to beat somebody up? I'm the guy. But even Don Hawkins could not win this war. Only God can win this war. And so just put that in your pipe and smoke it. It's God's going to accomplish his purpose. It's not determined by the bottom line on a finance sheet or the size of a congregation or the efficiency of plans of men. And you cannot, you cannot make plans of your own to, to, to change a culture. It's through on your knees, fasting and praying and looking to God that God himself would move in and renew people and stir and the fire of the Spirit would come. As I said, Moody said, Give me 10 men who fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and I'll change the world. But I need 300, folks, 300. And I hope you'll sign up in the four-year as you prayerfully. I, it's going to be, we're not going to start anything until the whole month is over because I want you to think about it because it's serious commitment to sign up, to say, I'll come. I'll come. We're going to organize into platoons of 10 with a sergeant of each platoon, and I believe in for miraculous results, even as Gideon saw a mighty a mighty battle won as God miraculously moved in. Will you bow your head with me? There's a war going on, folks, and God needs soldiers that are in shape and ready to fight that will pay the price no matter what the cost. And as the musicians come, 
God's shouting in these troubled times that he needs you. He wants to use you. He's shouting to cry out, to turn from your sinful way, to be devoted fully, and to do like Tillman did, is to sacrifice the pleasures and the leisures and the riches of this world for a greater cause. And it's not a war that frees America or fights terrorism, but it's a war that's a war that determines a place called heaven or hell. It's a spiritual war. We're fighting for the souls of our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors. We're fighting for the souls of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And we need to get a personal encounter with God. And when we do, we'll clean up our backyards. We will confess our sins. We'll turn from them and oh, the Holy Spirit will come like he did Isaiah in place a coal of fire upon our lips and cleanse us. And we cry out, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell among a people of unclean lips. So if there's anything in your life, in your home that need to go, anything you need to clean up, give it over to God. Turn from it today. Bury it. Ask forgiveness. God's not dead. He has a will and we are his church and he uses and flows to his church. We are the body of Christ and we need an army to rise up. Will you join the army of God? Will you fight? Will you sacrifice and pay the price? Only God can win the war, but he's going to win it through us. The humble, the weak, the chosen, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up, O oh soldiers of the cross. Rise up and let's win. Let's win through Jesus Christ and give him all the glory.